right, so let's call the meeting order uh, 706 p.m. Uh, sort of public comment. Uh, looks like there are members of the public, so we will go to action items. Uh, first uh, is the consent agenda. Uh, I do want to note that three items were added to this to the consent agenda. Um, regarding superintendent evaluation campus plan, um, the job description, and a uh, revised, well, I think it's actually the well, same thing that we last time, but um, without uh, the scribble. Yeah. So um, if anybody that's, if anyone wants to discuss those, they can make a motion to obviously move that session, otherwise. Committee charge. Move the consent agenda. So, yes. I'll move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Second. I'll second. Any discussion? I just want to, could you review what items are on the consent agenda that are not in front of me, perhaps, just to be sure? Just, just those three. The, the job yeah. description. The job mm -hmm. description. The committee charge. The mm -hmm. committee charge, which is the same as last week. Yeah. But Nicely written, yes. yes. But fully edited. Um, and uh, and then the superintendent. Oh, okay. And then. Uh, Electronic. Okay. I'm okay. I just wanted to make sure I knew what was with it. Um, all those in favor of the consent agenda? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Uh, now for item number four, uh, we're having Mike Berry, who has not yet formally appeared before us. Um, uh, present on curriculum instruction and assessment, including a uh, overview of framework for growth and uh, a revised copy of the continuous improvement plan, uh, which I will say was very informative. I, I got a lot of data I hadn't seen before. From, so, Libby, do you want to Yeah, go I'm going to start and talk about um, kind of a broad overview of plans for the future um, and how Mike and I are thinking about growing our staff capacity to reach all children. Um, so that, I wanted you to have this structure first and showing it to Jim, he thought it was a pretty good idea for you all to have this structure and head to your head first and then moved into Mike's, Mike's um, discussion around why we had to revise the continuous improvement plan and what it now has in it. So we wanted to put some context behind it before that. So, make sure this works. So that's the overview of what we're gonna do. One of the things that we're going to talk a lot about in the leadership team in particular is direction, alignment, and commitment. This is work out of the Center for um, Creative Leadership, and this is their structure and format for effective leadership. So when we're thinking about the direction piece of that Venn diagram, when we have strong direction, we have widespread agreement on group and overall, on overall goals, we have a shared understanding of success and agreed upon objectives to accomplish. Um, when we have weak, we're uncertain, and we're feeling pulled in different directions. Um, so as you're thinking about it, think about it in terms of the board structure, your board's work, as well as what you hear from the community about our schools in, in general. Um, so obviously we're going to be working towards that strong direction and making it crystal clear exactly where we're going as a school system. Uh, in terms of alignment, we want some coordination of work and tasks. Weak alignment means there's work that's isolation, in isolation, that there's a lack of clarity of tasks, um, that people are working with duplicate purposes. And, uh, and cross purposes. Uh, so right now, if you look at the entry plan that I gave you, I'm doing a lot of this work right now, doing a lot of assessment as where we are in terms of our systems alignment. That's primarily the work I have in front of me at the moment, um, and, and just gathering a lot of data and assessments around that. So that's where we are with alignment right now. And then commitment, I think this is actually where Montpelier is showing us the greatest, Montpelier Rock is showing us the greatest strength um, is our commitment together. So we, but when we have strong commitment, there's this mutual responsibility for the group's success as a whole. Uh, members feel responsible 
for the well-being of the group, and we know everybody else feels the same way we do. Uh, there's a strong sense of trust, and we stick to the group and what we believe in in really difficult times. I think there are plenty of opportunities that we could point to to say that Montpelier Roxbury has certainly done that over the last couple of years. Um, we commitment that members put their own interests ahead of the group. Members contribute to the group only when it's easy to do so or when there's something to gain. So I wanted to show you this, this over, this is the big umbrella. Um, we're going to be talking about this direction, alignment, and commitment a lot with our leadership team, meaning our building principals, Mike, myself, Mary, Andrew, um, and Grant, to ensure that we have strong direction, commitment, and alignment. We even have some surveys that we can get some data to see how we're growing in those things, where we're weak, and where we need to move forward to. So that will all be coming at you in the, in the summary of, um, that's part of the entry plan later on. Go ahead, Steve. Um, when we did a survey probably less than a year ago of faculty and staff around their some of their you know assessment of how things are going, you know we found things were generally okay, um, but one of the areas that really stood out as a especially a concern among them was um, sort of the initiative fatigue, yep. right? So we saw that as rising to the top almost of um, you know the initiative du jour, and I think that this third one commitment obviously addresses that, but. And there's a little bit of a you know the, the sense of time, but but really the idea being, I hope is that we'll have a sustained commitment to things um, rather than having 27 initiatives. You know you've 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 brought that down to you know your 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 focus and concentrated, but really the idea of sustained over time is what I think I'm I'm sensitive to when I think about uh, leadership and who's following. And you gave me such a good. Segue. Okay. And so this, it's almost like I planted you. Good. Because <laughs> um, when we're thinking about model for growth, I, I, this is based on the high reliability framework which comes out of Marzano's research. Bob Marzano is a huge researcher in education. I think he comes out with a book a week. Um, but he, he's like the big name, he's the big dog. Um, so his framework, and I apologize for the black. I'm sorry about that. We'll fix that. Um, Turning the light off, though? My. Like Particularly for the people at home. Yeah, oh, there you go. Yeah, that's much better. <laughs> so, getting at what Steve just mentioned around initiative fatigue and trying to do a lot, and we're not unique in that situation. I think many school systems, specifically successful school systems, fall into this line because they think they can do everything. Um, this will get at that. So, what Marzano has found with his research around very successful schools is that in order to build growth, we have to figure out what the right work is. And this idea around collective efficacy, that we're all in it together and we all believe the same thing, that commitment, is what can really move us forward. Um, so at the bottom of the pyramid here is this safe and collaborative culture. This is talking about do, we, do all of our kids, all of our parents feel that our schools are safe and healthy places for them to be in? Um, that's where a lot of equity work and, and what the Black Lives Matter flag came out of last year. Do we have that feeling? Do we, do we have evidence of that? It's also, though, looking at professional learning committee, com communities, where teachers come together and they're collaborating over common formative assessments they've done to see, are, are all of us knowing the same thing? Are all of us teaching to the same ideas? It's all within that space of safe and collaborative culture. For me, I need to have evidence that we have that in that we have that in place, because nothing else is going to be able to work unless we have that there. So this school year, for me, it's, and possibly next school year, depending on what the evidence is showing, we're working here. We're working within the culture. This is where all the equity work li lives. All the equity work that Montpelier Roxbury has already done, this is where that lives. And this is also where it's, what actions have we taken to ensure that this equity lens works for our students? We're at, what evidence do we have? So we're going to do a lot of work within there, which is going to decrease the amount of initiatives that we're really pushing in other areas. And, and not to say we're going to let them go, because we won't, we can't, <laughs> um, under the educational quality standards. But we need to ensure that happens first so that our other things we're working on work better. So we'll take some time to slow it down now. Is Whereas, that going to seem radical to people? In other words, are, you, are people going to feel you've abandoned what we've been working on for the last few years? Not if I frame it well. Okay. And if we get that feedback, then I need to rethink how I'm communicating that with people, because I need to tie it well for them in order to make this work, right? Um, so then the next piece is effective teaching in every classroom. 
one of the things that we're not there yet. We're not there in the sense of we don't have a shared common understanding of what effective teaching is. So teachers and, and teachers being the royal teachers, teachers all over say the words best practices all the time. If I were to ask five different teachers what best practices are, I'd get five different answers. So what we really want to say is this in Montpelier Roxbury, this is what we believe best practice is and get everybody on, on that page and have assessment and evidence that shows us we're there. We're not there yet. We have to get this in place first. Because in order to get here, some people have to let go of things. Some people have to build a whole lot of capacity in other areas. Um, and that's where that equity work is tied as well. So the idea of equitable literacy practices, equitable everything, falls into that. Um, then we go into guaranteed and viable curriculum. What's our guaranteed and viable curriculum? And what is our actual curriculum? Because those things are often very different. And if you've had a kid who's been a third grader and had two different teachers in third grade and they learned two different things, then you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? So that's, uh, that's Mike Berry's work right there. But he's going to start some background work on that this year. Then, if you see this, the next step is proficiency-based grading. So when we got the educational quality standards that talked about from the Agency of Education that talked about proficiencies and all that kind of stuff, they missed all of this. And the AOES is to start here. So a lot. Of, so we're really going to look at those proficiencies to say I had a great conversation with Michelle about it yesterday, around are we really there? Or does it what we're doing really work for proficiency and the intent of the law and intent of what this theory of action is? And then finally, way up at the top here is personalized learning. Montpelier has been doing a long time. Montpelier High School, anyway, has been doing a long time with their their program in the com community, which is fantastic. So then questions around that I'm already asking is, um, how many, what kids are accessing it? Are certain kids accessing it? Are all kids accessing it? Um, and what's our success rate on that? So again, just looking at some of these ideas, these are some questions that we're going to be asking. Do faculty, staff, students, parents, and community feel the school safe? Um, do we maximize collaboration? Or are we more collegial? We get along, we have a good time, but do we actually collaborate on the right work? Does everyone take responsible for responsibility for high levels of learning for all students? That's the biggest and the hardest question in the bottom of the pyramid. Um, effective teaching in every classroom, is there variability? Do we work within the shared belief, belief system? Are we systematically collecting data to ensure that that is happening? Those are some of the questions I'm asking there. Um, the guaranteed and viable curriculum, obviously, is clarity on the what. Do all teachers know the standards and teach to them? Um, does every child have the opportunity to learn at grade level? So even if, if kids are struggling academically, are we, are we not teaching them in the standards that they should be taught at? Because that's an equitable thing. Um, is content teachable and available for instruction? Do we know what our priorities are? And then proficiencies. This is a lot of the work that the high school is doing. I think we can really tighten it up across the board. Are teachers clear on the learning progressions? That's what Michelle and I were talking about just the other day. So differentiation is possible. Um, is data analyzed, interpreted, and used to monitor how we're doing? And are we clear about what the targets are? And then, of course, personalized learning. Do we have the system in place for, to truly personalize learning? And are all students taking advantage of it? Do we know which ones aren't? And how can we target that population? And, and here's my big one. It's not just the program, the community-based program, but personalized learning has to happen in every classroom. So do, that's a paradigm shift for pedagogy. And do teachers know how to do that? That's a huge paradigm shift. Um, so that's, that's probably where we need to go next year, I, I'm thinking, anyway. So this is the baseline. This is like the, the building blocks of where we're going to go, which helps Mike talk about the continuous improvement plan. Any questions about this part of it? This is multi-years. This is not this year, but <laughs> multi-years. Well, I, mean, I guess that's kind of my question is it's multi-years, but you know, for the student next year, we want all five of these things to be working as well as possible for students next year and the year mm -hmm. after. So, you know, from you know, obviously, you know, things will improve over time, but how do you ensure that you know next year you've got all five pieces working well for students next year? My, my answer to that would be if you, when you know more, you do better, right? So we have a lot of learning to do, and we, lots of, everybody has a lot of learning to do. We have a lot of learning to do, and as we continue to build knowledge, that's when change starts to happen in a different way. And I'd say that if we don't have a healthy culture at the bottom, that we don't have shared belief system, that commitment earlier from the DAC, 
then we're not going to move forward. There's always going to be that pocket of teachers that that yeah. that are different than other teaching and other learning and that kind of thing. So I think we have to go slow to go fast, mm -hmm. and that when you know better, you do better. And so we're, we're going to do a lot of learning around that on, with the basis of being a healthy culture. So I'm going to add to that, I guess. I absolutely agree with you, and I'm going to wait to see what Mike says about um, it was here, I just didn't see it later on in the how, that we really did well here. Our kids in general do well, except for the low socioeconomic kids. So those are the kids I'm wishing in the next year or two we've paid attention to so those kids can have more attention. Mm -hmm. And that's looking at our systems and structures mm -hmm. around um, multi-tiered system of supports so that we need to strengthen and we need to rethink. So we have a lot of capacity building to do within those systems and structures. Okay. Just, just quickly, I think um, it's all great. The, um, I think again, my, my concern about new leadership, abrupt shifts, uh, leaving people feeling like what's going to be continued, what's going to be abandoned, what's going to be layered on top. Um, it might be helpful to, you know, we spent a lot of time in the last few years learning the initiatives du jour ourselves in terms of um, what was coming out of um, out of the agency of ed yep. and also um, sort of what are some of the, the modern best practices and some of the things that you know some of the, the alphabet soup stuff um, that we've been learning about um, it might be helpful to seed the this presentation with a little bit of that in other words you know things like you know you talked a little bit about personalized learning but the flexible pathways um, that term or um, universal design um, and how you've built that in um, and just the PLP in general yep. um, to the extent that you can um, recycle some of the old acronyms and use them and give them the context in this mm -hmm. um, I think it might help people stay with you at the very beginning um, when they see that oh yeah all that work all that professional development I've done all that shifts we've done in our team it's okay because yep. it's still here okay. and it's still yep. moving forward yeah. yeah, and the next time, next board meeting that we have, not the retreat, but um, in September, the I can't believe I'm talking about September already, oh, yeah. but the first board member board meeting yeah, in September, one of the pre the presentation I'm going to do for you all in terms of this kind of focus on learning is the board's role on ESSA and EQS educational quality standards, which will bring a lot of that those pieces in. It's going to sound very familiar. Okay. Around a lot. I mean, of it's those. great for us, but I'm thinking in terms of as you bring the whole school along with you. Yep. Um, they put a lot of work in the last few years into one direction and if they feel like you're shifting it that could be great as long as they understand it you yeah. know, understand where you're going why and yeah. how their all their investment has, has yeah. is going to pay off and I think the shift is going to be we're going to slow down yeah that's yeah. the shift not get rid of but slow down so that we do it well yeah make sure that, that everybody's caught up yeah. right now we have some right they're not caught up. Out yeah. here yeah we, we have pockets good one I think the other thing I'm counting on you for, because that's what you do, is that um, for us and the faculty to hear about the why. Mm -hmm. So if the data is there that says, by the way, even though we've been doing this, it's really not working for these people, for sure. and we're going to change it slightly because, and this is why, people are more apt to accept that than yeah. just... Uh, exactly. Guess what we're starting tomorrow? But yeah, right. the data, yeah, yeah. we have the we're figures. New <laughs> acronyms start today. <laughs> I'm counting on you. We're not going to do that at all. No way. <laughs> no way. So I'm going to turn this over to Mike, who is one of the best hires you all have ever made, right here. <laughs> uh, hi. So I just wanted to say I haven't had a chance to say it to thank you for this opportunity to be a part of Montpelier Roxbury. I haven't had a chance to say it to you all. Uh, I'm very grateful. Uh, so. I'm going to talk a little bit about the continuous improvement plan and why we needed to revise it. Um, and I'm hoping to make a long tail short, but stop me along the way. Up here you'll see our, our vision statement and then our theories of action that I took from the revised CIP. But what I'm really going to talk about is why we revised it. So there were three main reasons that we revised it. One was time. So uh, grant submissions and CIP submissions were due June 30th, and they, we needed to get hopping. Um, so that was one component. <coughs> component number two was that there are two houses that live in the Agency of Education that claim ownership of the Continuous Improvement Plan. 
One is the school improvement team who wants a CIP to be very organic, go where you want to, talk about attendance, farm to school, whatever you think is valuable to your school community. And the other house is the consolidated federal grant team and they want a very prescribed, specific, structured, continuous improvement plan that speaks to federal funding in a particular way. Only one of those houses gives us money. <laughs> so, and, and the Agency of Education would tell you this. They would say that these two houses are in conflict right now with this particular thing and working on how to reconcile that. And the third reason was that our funding structure changed. As a merged district, we are no longer school-wide which basically means that your title funding came in a lump and you had some flexibility in how you would spend it amongst the schools. Now you are targeted and ranked, which means you get money per school and it has to be spent in that school for a very particular thing. In that building? In that building, <coughs> yep. Um, and mainly that means for Title I interventionists and Title II coaches. Uh, and that's how that worked out. Professional learning. Professional learning, yes. So those were the, the three big reasons that we had to revise the CIP plan as it was written. Not because it was bad or to dismiss any of the hard work that went into that, but that as it was written would not align with our submissions for investments or positions or title funding at all. There was no way for us to make that work. And with the timing, uh, um, you might be shocked to know this process doesn't move fast. So when we came in on July 2nd and recognized that we needed to get this in, we didn't have as much time as we would need to round up the whole team, go back in, discuss it, explain why we need to change this. We needed to make some changes pretty darn quick. Um, but we were able to do it and keep the spirit of the original continuous improvement plan. So we focused on three goals. We had literacy, mathematics, and then equity, personalization, and proficiency-based learning which covered all of the broad topics that were written into the original continuous improvement plan. But we were able to rewrite it in a way that adhered to what particularly the CFG house of the AOE would want to see so that we could fund positions that we'd already committed to and good work with kids that need it right now. Um, and just a little caveat, there were some changes that we need to kind of keep an eye on. So for example, in the new structure, UES did not qualify for Title I funds initially. We grandfathered them in, which we're allowed to do one year and one year only. But that's something that we'll keep an eye on for the following year. And that's because the way that you are funded for Title I now is based on your free and reduced rates per school. So they find the average free and reduced rate for the district. And then if you're at or above that rate, you get Title I. If you fall below that average, you don't. Um, so that was a shift that also didn't align with the original CIP. So those are all the reasons that we had to revise it. Um, can, I, can I understand that, math? So we yeah. take a district average, which is four buildings. Four buildings. And we figure out what our average free reduced is. Yes. For the four buildings. Yes. And then we find the one or two buildings that are above, or that, are, that have less free reduced, and those people just, we just don't get funding for them. Correct. Well, that's nonsensical. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. We don't get Title I funds. Title I, title I, know, title I know. Two, Just Title I, but yeah. still. It's a surprise. The merger, was... the merger caused us to have a wider uh, range. Range. range in the free and reduced than we had before. We had a very narrow range. Right. Yeah, so, but it, it couldn't make that much of a difference. Is that what tripped it? Was it the, the merger? increased range? Of, it, what, it, what specifically? It was the, the increased merger? range having two elementary schools okay. was mm -hmm. the other component. Okay. When you have two elementary schools, regardless if you're targeted Title I or school-wide programming, you have to target and rank. It, yeah. it's, it's just something you have to do. When you have two schools within the same, you know, same scope of grade span. Okay. So that's my story. <laughs> um, it, we had a lot to build off of from the previous CIP, um, but both Libby and myself have had kind of uh, a lot of experiences in submitting CIPs and, and working with grants and, and we know what the agency is looking for and we were able to honor the spirit of that original CIP with a, a much more um, honed in and zoned in continuous improvement plan that would align easily with our investments. 
I know that you had to do this quickly, but I also know you, the administrative team was all together recently. Yes. And so um, you went over this and the administrative oh, team yes. feels great about this. Yeah, they had the revised copy before we even submitted it, reviewed it. They understood what was going on. Okay. And administrative teams across the state, um, and I heard this from Mike, um, have been aware that for years things were going to change with grants. Um, they're going to get harder to, to administer. They're, there's going to be less allocations. We've been hearing it for years. So they were prepared for that. Um, their priority was to really secure those positions that work with kids and educators. So that's what we made a priority um, in the process. So this is kind of a little broader question. So in the pantheon of plans yeah. that, a, that a district creates um, and documents and submissions and Which god is CIP, and what are its powers, and why should we respect it? Yes, that's a great question. That's exactly how I would have asked it, too. <laughs> um, so here's, here's where I think. I think the two houses would answer that differently. I think the continuous improvement folks hope to see it be a huge part of what drives us within the ESSA process. And Libby, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think they, they want that to, they sincerely want it to be a meaningful process that moves our schools forward in the direction that we want it to move forward in. What triggers the trip is the federal regulations around funding and the consolidated federal grants. And they're, they're two kind of distinct perspectives on school improvement. And they don't, they don't mesh. Um, so for example, if, if we chose, and I'm just choosing these at random, if we chose farm to school equity and um, uh, bass fishing teams as our three priorities, that would be fine with the continuous improvement team. And that would be something that would drive us in the direction we chose. And we could align that with ESSA and figure out how that works, how we're going to measure it, all this stuff. For the consolidated federal grant team, that would be a non-starter. We can't fund any of that. We can't support any of that. That's not moving your schools forward. We want research-based interventions and programs. We want highly qualified educators, coaching teachers. We, that, that's how we're going to move schools forward. So right now, the work that they're doing at the AOE is trying to figure out that meld. How do we how do, we do that? And I actually think um, the new laws around census-based funding and all of that are kind of moving towards the looser direction how we spend federal funds and how we, how we work for kids, how we do a better job at that. But as a, as a school board, yep. why do you know, we talk, we've talked about it, and I don't think we've ever really done much with a, sort of a district strategic plan or right. a long-range plan or a, whatever other kinds of plans we want to create. Yep. Um, we do our annual planning around what board priorities are. We do budget planning around what we're going to be doing this year. Um, the CIP has traditionally been really administrative driven and uh, kind of presented to us as this is the product of the administration. Yep. And as a board, I'm not sure how much I care about a CIP. Um, do, I, do I ignore the CIP? Thank you for the money, feds, and we're, we're gonna use that money now. It will be consistent, because you're a grant source. You know, we're, gonna be, we're gonna be faithful to you, but it's not really our big plan for the year. I think, um, I don't wanna speak for Libby, but I, I think what she presented here, coming with what I know is coming from ESSA, eventually the CIP will be something that drives us and moves us. This CIP model has only been in place for two years. Okay. I think last year when, when they gave us the CIP, I asked that question, yeah. like, is this extra or is this what you're really working on? And the principal said, this is what we're really working on. So. It's, it's meant to be that driving thing, and eventually it will, it will be. be. There's just a, and, and the AOE would tell you this too, there's just this little hiccup that doesn't make it. It's connect. not. It's not everything that they're working on. Right. 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 That's Big where we got right. stuck. Yeah. Is yeah. that right. it's only a small piece of what we're working on, oh, especially piece? as a board. It, well, if you think about the three things that you named, Steve, one of them being budget planning. This is significant for budget planning yeah. because we pay for ten positions, not that many. He's, well, yeah, about ten positions 10. out yeah. of it. So if we were to say whatever, we're just going to ignore that federal grant funding. And we got to come up with some money locally and or you know the fact that UES was grandfathered in this year if they do not if that free and reduced doesn't increase next year they don't get money like we can't give them title one money 
So then, do we have how many interventionists paid with money from UES? We have one, one. right now. So one yep. full-time position is going to have to be made up in local funds. Um, or, or else discontinued. We, or discontinued, right. So so it does affect, influence budget quite a but bit. But that, you know, that's like saying we have, I mean, I get that, but uh, you know, if we have a funder who wants to do you know, buy pizza ovens for us. We're gonna we're gonna write the grant. We're gonna get the money. We're gonna do the pizza oven, right? And that's gonna be piece of our grant of our budget for the year, just as this is. Mm -hmm. But it's not. It doesn't encompass our re, our our holistic improvement plan for the district. It's more of satisfy a funder. And I'm not. This is positive. Satisfy a funder and and do what you say you're going to do for those 10 out of however many positions we have. Uh, but don't don't let it be the document that encompasses all planning for yeah, the district. Is, well, unless we wanted to use it and <coughs> add other things. Which we can, add, we can do. Yeah. yeah, because then we could have one plan that sort of mm -hmm. starts with the things that we need to access that funding, but also includes other things. So the agency is having that struggle, and maybe we will have that struggle, too, about where how comprehensive we want this document to be for us. Right. Um, so the revision yeah. really took those big plans and those things that are driving us and just narrowed it down mm -hmm. to appease one house. Mm -hmm. But it didn't get rid of that stuff. So if you look in, in the original CIP and you look for literacy components, they're all there. There were a lot of You just restructured. That. Right, exactly. Tina. I think the other thing to think about is I worked at the agency for 10 years, and it's always been this struggle. Vermont thinks this way about doing things, but the federal government is thinking about the entire nation, and they have these rules they're thinking about, and the money comes from there. So you have to tend to the rules. You want the money. You have to meet the rules, and then see how it fits in your whole plan. But I think in fairness to the agency, it's always fighting to get yeah, what we need because we are different. We're little, and we don't compare to the rest of the country in lots of ways the country would like us to. So it's been a continual fight. So you're saying, so you're saying the agency vision for the CIP is that it is your plan for your district. It is the plan yes. for your district. That's the agency vision. It's not a plan for your district. It is the plan for your district. Well, and the that they're not thing, maybe there all the way yet. The, the other thing that I always found hard was that I wanted a plan that somebody could read. Mm -hmm. And the federal plan was never anything that you could pass out to the public and they could look at it and say, oh, yeah, I get it. I know what you're doing. It had too many things about okay. it. And the agency has always tried to say, is there a way to get a plan that meets the federal funding, does everything it wants to do, but is what I'd call readable. And this well, is good. Yeah, and I, I'm wondering why the two houses are necessarily in conflict if if you're gonna house one house within the other. I mean, if, you know, obviously, you know, the federal funding and the positions yep. should be part of your broader... Here's what I would say. So last year when they rolled this out, Libby can attest to this, um, first they said they were just gonna show it to us. And, and we didn't really have to use it. And then about halfway through the process, yeah, we want you to use that. So really, this is the first full year that schools in Vermont have been using mm -hmm. this continuous improvement plan. Um, and I, I think, you know, year, if you consider that year one last year, the pilot of, of consolidated federal grant administrators figuring out how to navigate this and schools how to navigate this, year one, we're doing okay. Next year, going in with the big overview and what we know about ESSA and how we can structure this, we're gonna do a much better job of tailoring a CIP to speak to both houses. Um, as far as the Agency of Education and why those two houses aren't meshing, there's a lot of reasons. <laughs> so get used to the CIP, its power is growing, and yes. we will be using it as a, as a more comprehensive Absolutely. document for our district over time. Yep. Is that, Libby, would you say that's yes. about right? And I'd say, coming from my previous district where I was in charge of this process, our CIP was grander because I had the time to build it with my leadership teams mm -hmm. in my each of my schools, whereas we just didn't have the time. We had to, we have to, we have to get that funding guaranteed sure. so that we could pay people's salaries. So, I, so there's some, because of the timing, we couldn't make, necessarily make it the way we want to, but it's possible because I did in the past and I'm sure Mike did it for his previous district as well so that it didn't just look like, we just think interventions and coaches are what's gonna change everything, you know, or what's gonna drive us. 
Um, and that's kind of what it looks like right now, but that's because of necessity. Okay. So when, when you were working on your grand plan in the previous district, was it solely the administration team that was working on it, or did you have more board input, more parent, public input? <coughs> what was? We, the, <laughs> we had not as much parent input as we probably would have liked. <coughs> Um, but we had distributed leadership teams, so teams from each school, um, principal, assistant principal, if, not, if they had one, coaching staff, special education leaders, you know, so teacher leadership teams as well all worked on this plan, and it's, it's a yearly process, you know, we're looking at goals yearly and, and coming back every, every couple months saying, how are we doing, what's our evidence towards that, how do we need to revise and revamp now that we know more, um, so it's an organic process that nails it in the CIP at the end of the year. Like you can bring things together. Do you but envision yes. a board role? I can envision a board role in holding us accountable to what we say we're going to do. I think that's the biggest board, board role in terms of the continuous improvement plan. Is this is what, these are our goals. This is what we're going to say we're going to do. So we have to show you that in good faith, we're making some efforts and we're doing it. And if we haven't reached it, then we better give you some good reasons why we haven't. You know. Um, that's the major board role. As community members and parents, then we have to figure out a way to get input there too, because that is absolutely part of the ESSA law, is that parents and community play a larger role in continuous improvement planning than they have in the past. If this is the big planning document for the district every year in the future, I wonder if the board needs to advocate for a big role. Because the board, one of the board's jobs is to bring um, the priorities of the community to the district. I think the board's role in that is for mission, vision, and ends, po ends policies, because that's the that's for the priorities of the community. That should represent the priorities of the community. So what we present to you in a continuous improvement planning, knowing teaching and learning really well, should represent that thinking. And, and how I, does S envision community and, and parent? They just say do it. There's no, there's no action steps behind it. Mike, would you say anything? Well, is it action steps or is there like kind of substantive well, things? The, the only thing I would say is that we've had stutter steps at both the CIP and ESSA. So they, I'm trying to say it in a very politically correct way. We hear about it almost halfway through the year. So that's that's when we get our first glance at it. And by then, your, your routine, and your year-long stride is already, already started. So it's hard to kind of start those up. So CIP last year we found out about it in December. I, I can't remember. And you know by then how do you how do you thoughtfully involve people in your year long mission because people get into the school year zone. So with ESSA one of the things that they showed us is that there is kind of a rhythm to it. There's there's a start. There's a period where we get a report card as a district and schools. There's a period of review. There's a survey period. There's all these things. So once we have a chance to get that rhythm to align with this overall structure. I think it'll feel really good to everybody, but ESSA does not say this is how we want parent involvement to look. It's just you have to do it. So once, for me, it's about rhythm and routine where people can feel comfortable knowing when things are gonna happen and how they're gonna happen. We haven't had a chance to really take that for a ride yet. Sure. So if the CIP has kind of technical education, here are, priority things that we're going to work on for the next few years. Um, it seems to me that our role is to make sure that we have you guys explaining to us why those are the priorities mm -hmm. and what, how those move us toward our mission. And then it's our job to work with the community to kind of check that, like, okay, the administration is telling us they're doing X, Y, and Z for these reasons, and it's going to move us the direction we want to go. Community, does that sound right to you? And kind of go, does that seem like? I was reading, I was reading something the other day, and it was about superintendent school board relations kind of yeah. thing, and, and one of the quotes that I loved in it was that it's my job to make you sound so smart about your education. <laughs> so, so, Absolutely. So that, so that you can go out and talk to the community. But also then make sure that when... There's feedback. Yeah, so you make us sound smart by ensuring that we understand why you're doing what you're doing. But then we give that to the community, and if they say back to us, that is 
totally not what we want. We don't see bass fishing moving us <laughs> toward, you know, meeting every child's needs at all. And then we have to come back to you and say, can you either explain this again or maybe do something different? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, Steve, what I would think our job is, is to look at the plan presented and see if there's something glaring missing that we know is of concern to the community to say to the administration, um, I don't see this here. So where is that and how might you handle that? It's their job, in my view, to write it, to present it to us, and have us sort of review it. And I'm absolutely in agreement that the superintendent's job is to educate us, so we're really smart. <laughs> but we don't have that. That's not what I'm hearing. I'm not hearing that we have the power to say it's not OK. It's it, not that it's not OK. I think if there was, for example, I said, I want to hear about the kids, the low socioeconomic kids, and what are we going to do to make them? Well, that's something I've heard from the community. And I want to make sure that somebody explains to me where it is in this plan. I'm not necessarily changing the plan unless Libby says to me, oh, no, no, I'm not at all concerned about the low socioeconomic kids. I, I don't want to. Which would never come out of my mouth. Which would never come out of her mouth. But the point is, then we'd have to have a discussion, right? right. But right. she's but more going to explain to me where it is. I, just, I guess I'm just, and I, I'll just admit that I don't understand this, but it seems to me that, and I, and I like the way you retorted what I said, Libby, about um, you know, what our role could, would be, which is to check it against the, the policies effectively. Um, but if we're checking it against the policies and we disagree, are we approving it before it's submitted? Or is this an, is this an yeah. Or is this something that's continually revised oh, with the agency? It's a living, living, breathing document. Does that mean the agency gets revisions regularly from us through the year? Uh, they would like to. <laughs> they have it in phases right now. This yep. is phase one. Somewhere in the in the grant software it says phase two. Nobody knows what that means yet. And it also says phase three and phase four. So we're waiting. And it goes back to how Mike so nicely put the routine and, and taking things for a test drive. They're taking us for a test drive right now with this particular move, and they're not telling us what those mean because I don't know if they know yet. They do. I, just, I guess, you know, I don't understand why we have the major planning document for the district is not board approved. Oh, it is, it will be, it is board approved before it gets started. It is, you just will Just before it's submitted. You. Yes, before it's submitted. There's a, actually a box that says, here's the date the board approved it, and here's the minutes that we can attach to the, there's an actual spot for that in the grant software. Right, that's very reassuring. I mean, yeah. I think that the idea is, you know, we will we will need to check it against some standard, and it's not, and policies is an excellent one. Um, we'll have to very carefully craft our policies to make sure we're getting what we want. But there's a, but that's a. Uh, you know, I think that I'm, as it grows, as this God becomes more powerful, um, it's going to control our budget more, and it's going to instead of having a budget discussion about budget priorities in isolation, that con that will be part of a CIP, I imagine. Mm -hmm. And when that's happening, we have to really, as a board, stay on top of um, when is our opportunity to influence the direction of the district. And um, I think we've tried various entry points in the year to do that, and they haven't always been smooth. And so we have to, we have to figure out as a board is what is the, the least friction way to influence the the annual, you know, the annual execution plan. And so uh, if the CIP is it, I just want to make sure I understand, it sounds like the CIP is it. And, or will be it, maybe isn't yeah. there yet, but someday it will be. And kind of just focus where we should in terms of uh, trying to assert our, uh, our influence as board members. Mm -hmm. That's all. So just trying to figure out how to do it without friction. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, because, you know, obviously, it, needs to meet certain requirements, but you know, if we have a, a major document guiding our budget decisions and that document starts to veer from where the community wants to go, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. I'm going to hold the bass fishing at bay. Mike's a little upset with that, but that, I'm going to hold that. She's it's a negotiating card. It's an official athletic team recognized by the BPA now. Provides <laughs> <laughs> just ounces of excitement. <laughs> Thank you both for yeah. really easy to understand presentation thank you yeah and just those those are great and more of those 
on a regular basis. To the board meeting. To the board and I think to the public uh, as well. And the fewer acronyms always the better. <laughs> and when we use them, because we use them daily. Yeah, no, I know. You just gotta, you I, just I know gotta call, on, yeah. call us out yeah. and just say, what's that mean? Uh, great, so uh, we have uh, policy reading to provide discussion and action items. Um, first is transportation. I have something to add to that, comments on that. Uh, as you know, you know, this has been introduced. It's a required uh, policy, which I think is, right, that's something we kind of figured out recently that it was it was required a little more urgently than we thought. We had two required policies that the district had not yet to adopt, the transportation policy and the student self-expression okay. policy. Um, I just want to acknowledge this policy is kind of a road policy to get something on the books. Uh, there has been a transportation committee that's looking holistically at, um, at basically ways to get a policy in that is more equitable and, and serves some uh, students who right now uh, are are not being well served from a transportation standpoint. So uh, while we're going to move this forward tonight, I would love to put a sentence in there just that the board uh, intends to you know revisit this policy as per the work of the transportation committee, uh, you know, within the year. Uh, one note, Jen is. It says has decided to furnish slash has not has decided not to furnish. We need to choose one. I think we have decided to furnish. Yeah. Yes. Um, we still have both choices. Well, that's not good. Well, there are lots of blanks in here too that have to mm -hmm. be filled yeah. in. This exactly. is just it's a general just, just first just reading. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, just as a thought on your yeah. agenda. I don't think parents will need this policy, no. but we do have parents that are some parents may read this policy. Right, there are a couple who are very concerned about yeah. this and have come to our meetings, which is pretty <laughs> unusual. Would it <laughs> would it be um, maybe wise to add a, a little language to what you suggested? Say we recognize this, the current policy is not meeting the needs of the whole district, which is why we're going to come back to this when the transportation committee makes its recommendation. Something like that. So we could look, we show this to some of those parents and say, look, we know this isn't complete. We're not just saying we're coming back. We know it's not meeting your needs. We just a couple more adjectives. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <coughs> this is the minute. I mean, this policy is so bare boned. I'm not sure we can say it is or isn't. I think if the minutes reflect that, we'll readdress it. I think that'll take care of it, won't it? I'm just a little worried. I'm not sure people. Committee actively meeting? The transportation is actively meeting. We passed a draft uh, transportation policy onto the policy committee for review. Um, and it's not this one, I assume. And it's not this one. This one kind of, because the one that we proposed Uh, the one that we proposed, I think, requires some discussion by both the policy committee and the board. It's it's long and it considers you know, some of the challenges that we face in terms of. Well, I'm I'm sure that addresses, and it's a subject that's been brought up in the community, isn't here? A distance from the school, yeah. for example. Yes. That isn't even addressed here. Yeah, and this, that's a big. This I think just is a Can I couldn't hear that. Can you say it again? Distance, distance from the school. Yeah. We had a policy that you know you weren't picked up. A certain, unless you were a certain distance from the school. Well, this, this gives the superintendent the ability to establish routes and to consider all of these factors, including distance to be traveled. I don't know whether Libby wants that kind of latitude under our current circumstances. Right. I was going to say, I, I, I wouldn't if I were the superintendent, given the community right now about establishing, she might establish the routes. That's not it. To establish, I will pick up this person and not pick up that person has been the discussion in this district, and that's where we need to know. And how based we on our current reality, yeah. the policy right now, yeah. as we stand right now in our current reality, 
shouldn't have a distance piece because we don't have the capacity at the moment budgetarily or in terms of just buses. Right. If we were to put a mile radius, for instance, and a kid lives outside of that mile radius and we currently don't have a bus going there, we don't have it in our budget to put a bus in. Right. So um, our current reality inhibits us a little bit on that. Yeah, yeah. We, we know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just want to make sure that we don't put something in tonight. <laughs> well, no, I know. I know. Call buses tomorrow. <laughs> my, my concern is that given that this says that it's all up to you, yeah. that those demands may be made. And, um, we just want to know, you, you to know you have support in uh, yeah, doing yeah, this, yeah. and I'm how would we do sure that? Yeah. Yeah. Steve, Address. my sense this is a real folk, real core operational issue, and the board should stay out of it as much as possible. And I think that um, if the superintendent can can um, accept the heat around this, which I think you probably can, I think that you know by creating a procedure that is um, based in some objective criteria, and that is balanced by a budget, then I think that the board should. This is a perfect area for the board to stay out of. I mean, I, I think the board may want to put in a transportation policy some values rather than some rules. Um, for instance, one of our values might be that we encourage a walking district, you know, or that we encourage as little use of fossil fuels as possible, or we, you know, we understand the economic, um, uh, uh, you know, sacrifices that are required when a bus is not available, or you know, bus route, you know, those sorts of, those are values. And if we assert those in a transportation policy, we've given the superintendent some, some values that the community should live by. But I don't think that deciding whether it's a mile or 1.1 mile or, or whatever that is, I just don't understand why we would, as a board, want to be setting that kind of an operational rule. I partially agree. I mean, I think there are, and there have been some, uh, you know, there's some equity inequities in how we transport kids. Uh, Depends how you define inequity. Well, it seems very equitable to me. <laughs> well, it's equitable in one in some ways, no. but in inequitable in others. You know, for instance, there there's a lot of people kids that can walk. There are a lot of kids that are in situations where walking is not practical, um, where they live you know, on the far ends of some streets like down Elm Street. Uh, up on Berlin Street, uh, you have situations where, you know, a, you know a, I mean, a single parent who lives up the top of Berlin Street with a 10-year-old fifth grader on a negative five-degree day is going to have to, you know, is going to have to either find a way to, to have someone drive their child to school or send them on a 50-minute walk alone. So where are you going to draw the line? I think you give the value to the superintendent. Yeah. The, say, here's the value we have. We understand the economic hardship. We understand the, that age is a determiner in what's appropriate for walking. I mean, I don't know, but where are you going to draw? You're going to start drawing bus lines? And around making sure that we give direction that those situations are, are taken account for. Because you know, we're a walking district. That's a lot, of, a lot of parents here who are in situations where, for them, it's not a walking district. And, you know, having their kid walk down Route 12 for three miles, you know, their their 11 year old walk down Route sure. 12, you know, back and forth twice a day, three miles from middle school. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's walking for someone on Liberty Street, but for for that family, it's not a walking district. Then let's not make it a walking district. Let's make it a busing district. But you know, the my point is, it has to be. I think we're talking about we got to be really careful about going into the details. And I think our previous policy maybe did too much of that. I, you know. It maybe had nothing about values and only about operational rules. And our middle school proclaims to be a walking school because we have no place for cars. But it's not really, right? So it can't be for some kids. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm very sympathetic to all economic arguments. Um, but I'm not really interested in having people come before us asking us to, to add their street. Right. Being one of the people that lives at the top of Berlin Street, Wait, we understand, we understand this problem, and my kids walked. And, and mm -hmm. I guess my thought just is that we just have to be equitable. I felt when my kids were there, it was okay. The people, I, they walked, but so did the people out Elm Street or somewhere else. So in thinking about it, to me, it's just a question of 
equitable? Are we, you know, not going to go out one street? And I agree with you. I, I can't know which of those streets and how far out to go, so I don't want to do that. But I'm giving it to the superintendent to say, just be equitable. <laughs> so that's a value. Yeah. So Jim, thinking about the context, so again, the Transportation Committee has a rough draft policy right now that's yeah. not in front of us. It's um, not in front of us. Right, the Policy Committee had recommended we bring this cookie cutter template from BSBA to the board to essentially get us through, um, to have something in the books to allow us to go. But it yeah. almost sounds like, as much as we're deliberating this now, and the fact that you're concerned that some parents might not take this draft well, that we should just completely hold off on adopting this policy until well, we have. Well, I, I, mean, I think it's fine to adopt this policy. It's always very clear that, that we're going it's to come back work to on revising work on revising it. And you know, you know, there are some volunteer parents who spent a lot of time on the transportation committee who gave you know a few hours, gave some thoughts. You know, there are some other parents who have been having conversations. So I mean, I think we need to have a conversation here from the public about the type of values and considerations that we want a transportation policy. And I just fear that, you know, kind of given that we've, we've had conversations, we've had some involvement, to kind of quickly pass a cut and paste policy and say, okay, we're done, you know, it's an operational thing, we're walking away, uh, is, is not considerate of the, the involvement that some people have, have already given. And I think they you know, deserve a, a deeper discussion, deserve to have, I think, some very valid considerations heard and to get some you know, assurances that, that those considerations are being taken into account what we're actually doing. In terms it's of not very many weeks, however, before the start of school. So no, we need to know that we have enough gonna, to, to start not, school. No, uh, we're, for start school. Yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna have a different or radically different transportation system for next for this, this coming year. For, and yeah, we're okay third. with that right now. I we're mean, okay with I don't think we have a choice. There's no, okay. There's no Okay, so that's but, all that right now. I yeah, think but I think we should. I think we should try to find some ways to um, improve the transportation options for next year. Pam Arnold and I have been talking about that, and one of the one of the contexts that Pam put it in, I thought very smartly, was that we have so many changes happening at Main Street Middle School because of the addition of Roxbury students coming in and busing coming in. That let's take this opportunity this year to study what's happening and then make some good decisions off of what we learn. This, I mean, this template is actually, uh, you know, the one, two, three, four. You could just change those one, two, three, four to anything you want, and you've got a pretty workable format for any po for this policy. Um, you know, age and health of pupils. Maybe you expound on that a little bit. Um, distance to be traveled. I mean, that just means nothing. But you could expound on that a little bit and speak to the economic or the whatever impacts of that. Um, so I think that. You know, you could start, this is a great document, and then it just doesn't have as much meat in it, maybe, as we need to add to it. Well, we might even need to revise the policy. I mean, what we might be able to do is, as long as, I think as long as the work of the Transportation Committee comes back to the board and through, what I might decide to do is, I'll take the work of the Transportation Committee, and Libby, go develop procedures under this policy that reflect these values. And we might just stay with that policy, and then, you know, sure the administration could come up with more specific procedures mm -hmm. that you know are reflected in the budgeting are reflected in your relationships with GMT, et cetera. So um, I don't think we necessarily have to you know, that 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 policy language might be fine because it's very broad. Um, but I, I just don't want this to be a, okay we're we're done with transportation, you know, thank you folks for putting all that hard thought into it. But surely um, we're then we're sweeping it away in you know, a five-minute decision and, and calling it operational. But surely you can just have that conversation with the members of your committee. Yeah, we, they're going to take it as we swept it away. I mean, why would they if you say we have to put this in place? It's a placeholder. Uh, Obviously, we're working on a new policy. I mean, yeah, no, I think that's fine. But, but Jim's saying maybe we don't do a new policy, and I think that's still yeah. up in the air is whether it be, it's a policy or. You know, a procedure well, I don't or think a plan. We're going to decide that right yeah. this minute until we right. see the work that they've done. <clears throat> so I move we adopt this. Second. 
Um, we're, not, we're not able to yeah, adopt it. first reading, right? It's, it's first, first reading. Oh, okay. Reading. Policy reading. Whatever you You're right. First reading. <laughs> I think you just have to first reading. Just read it. Right. Yeah, no, you just read it. So no changes. changes. Yeah. Well, you, now is the time that you can make changes, and then it has to come back again to change it. Looks I, good. I, I suggest we put the name of the district in those blanks. <laughs> good suggestion. Yeah. That's a good idea. That'll, that'll and choose the... Discretion. <laughs> and, and decide the decided... <laughs> and, and choose the decided to or decided not to. Yes. This last line is kind of odd. Maybe it's always done and I've missed it. I don't think so. And shall include in his, his or her annual report to the board information as to all pupils transported by the school district. Yeah. It's like, have really? We like, we need a list or what? That whole sentence is weird because we have all these other policies about which contracts come to us. Yeah. I think those, yeah, those contracts would probably have to come before us. Based on other policies. Based on the It could be in the in an annual report to the board. Do you think um, that's a required sentence? A, uh, a description of how, you know, of, of this, yeah, it's just, yeah, strike it, strike the paragraph. Doesn't make any sense. Last paragraph. Unless it's, in, we should check the statute. Right, because because we, say, keep, we keep striking things. Bridget that would tell <laughs> us you can't yeah. do that without checking first. Because yeah. we can think how many details are in the warnings we have to present to the town. Like there's. And this is I a contract. Some schools own buses, so it's a case right. of the superintendent has to ask you, can they buy a new bus? Well, that's which is a in big sentences to this funds to purchases. maintain or operate equipment. Which right. Is a whole other. But that's why I say that's why it's here. If we were op operating our own transportation system, the superintendent might be coming to say we need a new bus this year. And by the way, it's going to cost. But again, cents. that's covered under other policies. Anytime she buys something big, she has yeah, it's to. That's capital. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. I guess is there any harm in leaving the sentence? Well, we are trying to streamline it. Maybe we should wait till Bridget's here. <laughs> yes, it's it has to be read again anyway, so let's reading. leave it until the yeah, next time. Thank you. Right. Uh, All right. <clears throat> and we're going to pass decided to furnish transportation. Pressing up has not decided to furnish transportation. Right. Transportation is not a required policy. It is. You are not required to transport. Hmm? You are not required to transport. But you are required. Yeah, but you're required to have a policy. Yes. 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 Got it. And we do transport some. Yes. Can Are we okay? Yeah. Um, we don't have to know that. Uh, student expression. Any comments or changes to that? And this is. Jenna says that this is our third reading. Sounds right. Doesn't say. Okay. When I reviewed it at least once. Anyway, when I spoke with Bridget last week, we went through some of these policies. She had mentioned that in the last reading for this, that she had said something to the board about she felt like it might not be in total alignment with the statute. Um, she had said that she didn't go back and review it, she didn't have a chance to, but she felt comfortable presenting this support for adoption just to keep things moving into the future. She'd spend more time with the statute and the policy to see if there actually was 
maybe a little bit of difference or conflict, but she said she felt comfortable presenting this to the board for adoption tonight. So that means we have a, well, does anyone have any further changes? Otherwise, we can entertain a motion to adopt. Motion to adopt. I move we adopt the policy, student freedom of expression. Oops, Heather is talking. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, it's for, has it been warned yet? Oh, okay. Okay, that's good to know. Good. So if we, so will it be warned for the next? Okay. For September, not for September. For September, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, because we've had the Baltimore Department. Okay. Thank you for that, Heather. And Heather, could you also make sure the minutes reflect that the board will take up the work of the transportation policy and in informing either revisions to the policy that was just read or uh, guidance for procedures for the support year? So, um, anything further on policies? Uh, agenda item number six, finance and operations, and we're hearing from Andrew LaRosa uh, on the updates to the playgrounds uh, and the projects occurring around the district. Yep. Thank you. So, uh, we are having our uh, kickoff meeting for the playground project tomorrow, uh, Ryan, myself, the designers, the engineers, the contractors, as well as the contractor, the site contractors, as well as the contractor for the vestibule project are meeting up at uh, ECI's office tomorrow. We'll have a, the priority of that meeting is coordination and uh, getting a handle on the schedule for construction. Um, they are the one date that we are hammering home and they've accepted and then realize is the opening date of August 25th or whatever it is uh, next uh, next fall so that's really where we're, we're building everything off of uh, with regards to specific dates of when they're going to start I'll have a better handle on that after tomorrow's meeting uh, and it's going to be a great opportunity for Ryan to meet the folks and start that relationship we're also Ryan and I are also starting a, an internal weekly meeting just for coordinating making sure that we're staying ahead of what's what's happening and what needs to happen as we go through the construction process. Tina. So after that meeting, if somebody says to me, what's the schedule for the playground progress, I might have something. What we are also doing with Mike and Ryan and myself is we're setting up a, he is setting up a <laughs> web page through the district website that will have the schedule and um, frequently asked questions. And that's, we're gonna, tr we're gonna really uh, focus all the information to that one, that one portal of information. So when someone asks you a specific question about the playground, what we would like to do is to be able, for you to feel confident in saying, Go to the web page. It's going to have the most up-to-date information, probably better information than I have. And if you don't get the answer you're looking for, there's going to be a link for you to email Andrew or Ryan, and they'll get that information to you as, as quickly as possible. And, and um, I'm basing this question on past experience. When I go to the website, it'll be painfully clear for me to go where to find it? There will be a link that says playground update. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, we'll make sure that it's very clear. And that will be up next week. Oh, yeah. thank you. And we're going to use Ryan's sort of weekly update to the parents as sort of the, the backbone of, because they're, they're going to the ones who are going to want the most detail and the most information. So that's going to be a really good uh, starting point for how we disseminate information. Sure. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Three, three questions. 
go. So I'll let you finish. Oh, I, I, so I heard you say, and I'm going to, I've been saying this, so I want to make sure we're right, sure. that the end date is the same. We're going to open August 25th. Kids plan on um, Next plan. year, um, mm -hmm. and that's staying the same. That is. Thank you very much. That's yours. <laughs> Uh, so one thing is, if Ryan's doing the weekly email to parents, which is awesome, can you make sure that he sends it to the board? Oh, you don't get it yet? No. Oh, absolutely, Nothing. I can make sure that that The wise owl is now something else. Yes. Like the swoop scoop? Or something? Swoop scoop. Yeah. Swoop scoop. Mm -hmm. Swoop scoop. Yeah. Swoop scoop. Yeah. Swoop scoop. What, <laughs> yes. what, those two yeah. words ordered in, in some fashion. Um, so yeah, if you can make sure that he subscribes all of the board members to that, um, absolutely. That that's something that we have that the principals need a reminder every year to make sure that the board members are on that list and not just the board members who happen to also be parents in that school. Yeah, because and he he's uh, Mike McCraith has been a good um, person for him to talk to. I heard the two of them just talking yesterday about how. He, Mike sends his soul, soul and salutes. Soul, I can never say that word correctly. Soul I need to know how to do that. <laughs> soul and salutes. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> just salutes to uh, the Times Argus. Yeah. You know, and those are the kind of things that Ryan's just new to Vermont, new to ideas of doing that. So, yeah, yeah I will make sure that that gets sent to you. Do you get the mainstream house school? Pam, no. Well, last year I had a middle schooler, so I don't but, know. But Steve, you don't have No, actually, I do. It's just. Uh, it's a little less produced than yes. the other ones, yeah. okay. and so I get it. It's it's uh, yeah. It's part of an email. Last year, I think she did it weekly. Yeah, no, I got yeah, it. It's, it's just, just, just totally informative. It's, yeah. it's, so yeah, it's very much it's necessary, but it's, uh, it's not, not as flashy not as others. And I was being for me. It's Pam. You know, she's, getting her, she's getting it done. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll speak for both Lisa and I. If you have children in none of the schools, we'd like to be on all the lists. So, so that was just that was question number one, and I'll probably forget all three. But the, oh, comment instead of question is right now on the website for people who are looking for information on the website. You have to click students. There's there's some choices: students, staff, families, something else. If you click students, there's a world of information there. If you click families or staff or anything else, it says content coming soon. But if you click students, there is yeah. in fact information. And there's a lot of great stuff. School. It's been, yeah. it's great. Yeah, yeah. And, but people have complained to me, yeah. there's nothing there. there. Yeah. You have to click students, it's and a then secret. there's stuff there. All right, we'll make sure that that's clear for our social media. <laughs> yeah, because it's, um, it's a victory. You guys are doing a great job, but yeah. you just need to get it out there. Yeah. And then the last question is Jay Erickson. Mm -hmm. Is he continuing as the project manager? No. Okay. Jay is, uh, Jay's been immensely helpful over the last couple of months. Okay. Uh, and the transition from uh, being a community liaison and doing some real legwork with permitting and all that, now that we've kind of gotten over that hump and we're, we're starting to focus on shoveling dirt, mm -hmm. that's, where, that's where this transition of communicating with the public and getting all that, that's where we're going to take that over. It just, we, too long of a lead time yeah. to get the information down the pipeline. So. Right. Um, by the time he'll get it from me or Ryan or the contractor, it's going to be a week old, and by then something will change. Right. So it's been I, I've, I've been ref I've been consistently referring people to Jay, but right. then you've been not mentioning Jay, so I just thought I should just um, now just now you didn't. Oh mention oh him, yes so yes yes. I thought I should just double check that. Yeah, ideally we're transitioning, giving him a break from having okay. to field all those uh, those questions. Okay, so send folks. A to the web page, but then if they still have questions, we'll have a link for our. You you if we don't Ryan. answer your question. There's going to be a link for Ryan and I. Okay. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to have <laughs> figure out a way that the question will go to both of us because I'm sure that's okay. not going to be just a technical question, but it's going to be an operational question, and we're going to yeah. we're going to say, hey, this is how I think we're going to handle this, and he's going to say, oh, this is how I think we ought to handle it, and we'll make sure that we're on the same page, okay. and communicate it back out. Steve. I just want to say great work on the was it CAX story uh, you got. Uh, I thought that you know there was a little news a news thing for the TV and I think celebrating the little victories is really important and um, I'm glad you did that and I think that if you can find other opportunities as the project goes on to keep some positive um, enthusiasm rather than people going oh my God more mud yeah right mm -hmm. um, I think that 
you know, celebrate little milestones, I think that uh, it'll help. But um, very positive. It's good for the district when you do that. So thanks. Yeah, and there's and Steve and, and uh, <coughs> the bridge and uh, right. CH there. They're always looking for stories. And we've got you know, a couple days, you'll see the sheep herder out on the bike path eating the poison ivy. So. Oh, that came out today. It was tonight. It was oh, tonight. Yeah, she yeah. went out there. Yeah. Yeah. She, was, she was doing a soft opening because she mm -hmm. was concerned about it, separation Andrew, anxiety. With Andrew's a wanted man by the uh, newspaper people <laughs> around. Oh. The, the city I posted thought, it on Facebook about yeah, okay. the goats. Okay. So. Yeah, I posted yeah. some pictures of it, too. Yeah. Yeah. I think don't touch the goats because they're covered with poison ivy. <laughs> That's Good very word. smart. I liked yeah. it. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's where we're at. We'll we'll uh, we'll do our best to give the best information we have and, and try to. And if the system that we set up is you're finding community members saying that's not what they're asking for, just please let us know so that we can change what we're doing. Yeah, and so one of the things that for for everyone, what we Jay and I communicated to the, the neighbors was. When you talk to the public, encourage them to come with us with concerns before they come become problems. Because uh, we can manage concerns and we can help with concerns and problems. Just you spend the time dealing with the problem, not the actual problem. So that's. I will agree with Steve in that it was well done. And what I heard is you, the work you spent with the community members directly on that street has been well worth your time mm -hmm. because the comments from other people to me have been, and they're not upset. No, and that was Jay. That's right, and I think that was really important and really good. Yeah, they're they're our biggest supporters. Say thank you, Andrew. Well, compliments come few and far between. <laughs> yes, <laughs> oh, well. receive them. <laughs> no, it was Jay. It was good. The construction on the building itself is happening simultaneously, or it what's will. the schedule on that? Yes, it will as well. I spoke with that contractor. Steel, they're still in steel shops. Um, so they won't even have steel um, available for that project for steel last summer was six eight weeks out so they're still in steel shops on that so it's it's going to be a little while before they get ramped but up they'll be breaking ground on yeah. things and such this fall yeah yes absolutely okay absolutely the goal is to get that one done as quickly as possible so that we can <coughs> make sure we don't have to okay. gain access to the back side will there be uh, is the preschool access on that preschool drop-off is going to be happening on the on the vestibule side or, so, or whatever you call that new, new thing? I think that what we're currently it's on Loomis yeah. school yeah. that that corner um, I, I it will evolve okay. I, I fully believe that uh, even some conversations uh, that we've had uh, today regarding low well, handicap parking and once the vestibule is done and their sort of work zone collapses right. we may have an opportunity to put some handicap parking down there okay until okay. someone says I need that for a bulldozer. Okay. So undefined, not going to be what at this point we don't have a firm idea how it's going to be used or when for the for the vestibule. Just the vestibule I'm talking as about. As soon as it's available, we're going to utilize it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Even though we're going to be doing playground out there too at the same time. We'll keep a corridor clear to that. Yeah. Okay. okay. And we'll how long is the vestibule supposed to take? Um, on paper, it will take. It takes four months. In reality, it'll be five. It takes five months to build anything. And how about the actual moving of the earth? Will it be done first? Again, that's contractor is, that's what they make their money is figuring out how to sequence these things the most efficient way they can. Um, we'll have a better handle on that tomorrow, exactly how much scope they want to take care of this fall, how much they're going to leave for the spring. Um, their and I shouldn't speak for them, and I, I get myself in trouble because I say, don't say things you don't know about, and then you start speculating about what they know about. All I can say is they want to do it as efficiently as possible. So I, I have to say what I'm thinking about is the start of school with large trucks outside my window if I'm a teacher. And it might be part of this year's education. I'm just thinking about it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And. Uh, the good thing is, is I do not foresee big trucks running around in the first couple weeks of school. So that at least people have a chance to understand traffic patterns, know where they're supposed to be, understand how things are laid out now, get used to that a little bit. And then, absolutely, the teachers are going to be concerned and the kids are going to love it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's true. 
I also want to say that Andrew's been putting in long hours mm -hmm. in our offices to ensure that this gets better. So, so I thank him for his hard work on this project. It's been a great addition to the team. Another project I'd like to bring up is the mudlock out front. Uh, <laughs> we met with Steve Avery from uh, the credit union and uh, Tom Bachman from Gossett's Bachman and they would like to sort of move this along. Um, and they requested that that we give them, that at least give them the okay that they can start meeting with some officials with regards to fire lanes and access and city officials. Uh, we want to just run it by you guys to make sure that people didn't come to you and say, hey, I hear you're building something and you guys didn't know about it. So if that's okay with you, we'll give them the go ahead and they'll start those conversations. Has the board already gone through this? Well, we have. Not with me, so that's why yeah. I'm bringing it back up. <laughs> they did. They came. Yeah, they came. A couple yeah. of months we ago about it. And, yeah. and sat yeah. here, and we approved yeah. them. Two months doing ago. That. Yeah. Yes, yes. Months it was. More than that. Well, we approved the contract with the credit union right. in June at the beginning of June. Right. right. And you weren't here. I wasn't. No, that's no. why I want to ask rather than. Yeah. Okay. So you've gone through the this. We approved the contract yeah. with them. We did. Okay. okay. It's the Montpelier board. Three-year contract. I think this joint board. Is it the joint? I think I it was joint. It was the joint board. Yeah. yeah. I don't think the Montpelier board was approving any contracts yeah. really at the end. So, I mean, in one sentence, what are we doing? Yeah. What are we doing? <laughs> um, Thirty-five parking spaces, I think. We have we have leased the mud lot to VSCCU. They use it during business hours, nine to five, Monday through Friday. We district has access to it nights and weekends, um, and they want to improve it, which is great. On their they're dime. going to, they're going to pay oh. to have the mm -hmm. it, the park structure plan. I, I just need to take off my board for a moment because I have a conflict of interest here. Um, but I tried to find you yesterday, but you weren't there. Um, so as the director of Friends of the Winooski River. I have a $20,000 grant to do stormwater design on that lot, which I would love to contribute to that process. Um, but I need to talk to you about how that how, works. How long is our lease? Three years. And, and, that, and the leaseholder improvements are done by us afterwards? <laughs> Thank you. We, need, we need to work on that. Are, is this lease signed already? Excuse <coughs> me. And I don't want to get too far out of my. There is a current lease. What now that it's going to be improved, uh, Steve Avery wants to speak with Grant and eventually you guys with regards to how do we structure it now that they're spending real money on this and sort of the exit clause, what the exit clause would be. Yeah, that's a big deal. Lease yeah. improvements should, are normally owned by us well, here, here's unless the, negotiated otherwise. Here's yeah. the scoop that we discussed with the credit union previously. And I, I'll, I'll just kind of fill you in a smidge because I. I was working on this contract with Brian since June of um, 2017, at least, and it took forever. And the big reason that it took forever is because Pietro Lynn does not like to obligate the district to long-term contracts, did not want us to get into a 20-year agreement with them. The credit union wants a 20-year agreement in order to make this investment. So I don't know where we are with that, but what we've learned somehow very far into this conversation was that in order for us to do a contract that's longer than three years, it has to go to a vote, a city vote. Um, I'm not sure why. And I'm not sure actually whether that's still the case now that with the merger, the city no longer owns the land. It's now owned by the merged I think that district. has changed since we are so a merged I don't, district. That rule may even be different yeah, now. So the terms of this contract are important because they could, they could effectively, without a three-year contract, lock us into much longer than three years. If we had a big buyout of the leasehold improvements at the end of three, we would be obliged to continue until that was no longer a budgetary consideration. I have no idea what the value, do you know the value of the leasehold improvements? They, the, the, the construction value they put yeah. on, uh, the number they sort of just tossed on the table without anything other than a 
colored pencil sketch was anywhere from 175 to 300 thousand dollars. Okay, and are they counting on? Does this go through city permitting? Yes. So there'll be, in addition to screening, there may be lighting requirements and things that aren't on here. That um, uh, so I just think you know, 300 thousand figure is a number. Three to 400 thousand by the time they're done, and and if you know maybe we're like you know at the end of three years we're like we'll buy it, we'll take it, you know we'll pay for it if we really need it, but. I just want to say that I mean approving a three-year contract is fine, but um, that that clause about what do you do with leasehold improvements is really what matters. So maybe since we're not very clear about the change from the Montpelier board to the Montpelier Roxbury board, the board should see the contract. Could we find the contract? Uh, the, the existing one. Yeah. Right. The existing the one that we just approved in June. Sure. Yeah. And if maybe you guys could find out what how whether we are still subject to the requirement to hold mm -hmm. a vote to sign a longer term contract what I'm going yeah I'm going to guess not because it used to be city property right. that's why that came about and it's no longer city property everything in the month years ago was mm -hmm. through the city because if their interest in doing this is contingent on a longer term agreement then we have more Work ahead. Yeah, and, and, and Grant absolutely realizes that. He's, he realizes that there's, it's bigger than just saying, okay, let's do it. <laughs> so yeah. he's aware of that. And, and they want to they get this wrapped up so they can make sure that they're making an investment in the right, that their the deal is equitable for them as well. Mm -hmm. are, are, uh, are we statutorily exempt from state permitting because we're an educational institution? No. 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 So, okay. This might have to go through more permitting than we think. Yeah. But it, it, it wouldn't be on us necessarily to do that permitting if they're yeah. going to. I remember that discussion about they were going to do it they're all. They're going to do it all. That's that was my question. What is our obligation to doing that? They were going to do it all. That, that, that's my understanding, but I'm only four weeks And pay for it all. Right. There's, well, there's, and there's also a new law that um, schools that have three acres of impervious <coughs> surface are subject to stormwater permitting requirements are subject to a stormwater permit requirement and meeting standards um, and I don't know I asked the state whether we whether this campus has three acres of impervious I think it probably does I think it probably does and so ensuring that that is done Probably Did I say three acres? We might. Well, we might even be over three acres without the absolutely the right. tennis court. That's right. Right. That would roof, tennis court, parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we shocked the board. Yeah. Other than that, it's a great project. <laughs> <laughs> and just there, no one's committed to any. They're they're just talking right now. They're going to actually show a dashed line to go up to fifty spots just for informational, just to see. How many is that? How that many is that's 40. Yeah. I think we talked in the, I think the contract refers to 25. Seems like a lower number. Yeah, Mike yeah. McCrae was confident that it was with the already, the current footprint, that it was not expanding on the current footprint of the lot. Right. But once they, that's going to be, that has to be a fire lane as well. So once they put in turning radiuses for fire trucks and things like that, we're going to wipe out a whole bunch. So it's. Yeah. So do we have another entry point on this decision where there'll be a contract modification that'll have to come back to us? I foresee that, um, I can see this as sort of two directions. One is design and it's sort of up to the owner to decide how much they want to pursue and how much they want to pay their engineers given the uncertainty of the contract and then it's the, the contract where that needs to go. We can find out more information and bring it back September and beginning of September. Thank I think you. it's always been just an area that we obviously feel like needs something done to it, but I think there's been a tension about do we really want to store cars at school more than we have? You know, why are we storing cars at school? And so it's just a, it's, it's a kind of a, has a, an emotional component to this project um, for some people. and. But I think that's what we discussed last time. Yeah, we did. Yeah, so just you know, just so that if it goes from twenty-five to fifty, wait a minute, where are we going? So that's all. I'm, twenty-five seems like we're just reusing the mud for some other. 
a useless purpose. We keep having this conversation, and nothing keeps happening with yeah. that. So We've had it a long time. If we, if the district wants to do something better with that mud, great. But if they don't have a plan to do something better with the mud, if they want to do something better with the mud, they've got to stop people parking there and do something better with it. But you can't let people keep parking there on that mud and not fix it because it's more of a mess as it is than it would be if it were. And I think that was the discussion we had when you weren't here and decided, yeah. well, let's let them do it. Right. They'll improve our mud. Yeah. <laughs> fix the mud. Fix Although the mud. sometimes nothing is the best solution. <coughs> Maybe not this time. <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. Do you want your drawing back? Uh, yeah. 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 Thanks. thanks. I think that's it, our agenda. Um, may, may I say? Oh, that's right. You before you stop, no, I'm not going to do that until okay. the uh, retreat. But I think we'll be warned to be at the historical museum. Uh, for our next meeting, yes. not called a retreat, but a meeting on the 15th, correct? Yes, we and have a day-long planning meeting at the Historical Society. Uh, the Historical Society or the Humanities? <laughs> it's, it's, it's at the Historical, historical Museum, museum. Yeah. as you walk in the front door of the Historical Museum. It's, it's the room on the left, on the left. and yeah. we're in that room. Last catamount. Pardon me? Where the big Stop. clock is. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which is a big room and air conditioned. Yes. Um, and I haven't said anything though, but I'll say it verbally. Uh, materials that for the retreat send to uh, Libby, Heather, and me by Friday morning. Um, by this Friday morning? I'm sorry, Jim, Friday say morning again. so we can get it out Friday afternoon at least electronic. Jim, I'm sorry, ready. what? Uh, any materials for your portion of the retreat? Um, or oh, did you tell these guys what their assignment is for the retreat? Oh, right. We did assign things. Yeah, and Ryan and Steve has been, you've been informed by Bridget, correct? Correct. By who? Bridget. <laughs> your budget execution stuff. Yeah, your budget. Because I won't be here. You won't be here? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I pre-forewarned pre pre -forewarned that a little bit, but I, I can't. Okay. I think then you have to talk to Bridget. You have to do what? Talk to yeah, Bridget. We'll talk off by well, That's Bridget fine. I got a fan here. I'm sorry. I can't hear. But I, yeah, I'm thankful for the fan. Okay, Bridget. Yeah. Yeah. I lose me into I can. Got it. And, and your process, your part overlaps a little with the budget planning part, so maybe we can rethink a little one. Is I melt this. Okay. All right. Anything else? Move I move to adjourn. Second. Second. Favor? Hi. Hi.